Good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's Writer's Workshop. Uh, our topic tonight is how to write a novel. Uh, and our instructor this evening is very familiar with what it takes to write a novel from ideation to completion. Please help me welcome back uh, local mystery author Molly McRae. Thanks for having me tonight, Solemn. Um, how to write a novel is a lot to cover in an hour, but we'll take a shot at it. Raise your hand if you read novels. See, that's great, okay? You're on your way to writing one because you learn to write a novel by reading them. And you'd be surprised, but there are people who say, um, I don't read, but I really want to write a novel because I know I've got one in me. It helps if you read them. Um, I'm a special, oh, you I read the kind of novels that you want to write and read the kind of novels that you don't want to write but that you enjoy anyway. Just read voraciously, read, read wide, read deep. You've got to read. I'm especially glad to be covering this topic tonight because every time I begin a new novel, I want to know how to write one too. And I'm currently writing my 20th novel. It doesn't get any easier. <coughs> Um, last week, I asked some of my writer friends a question. They're all published novelists um, at various points in their careers. Some are traditionally published, some are self-published, some are both traditionally and self-published. I asked them not to think about the question too much, um, just to answer with a word or a sentence, something shorter rather than long. And the question was, what's the first thing that enters your head when you think about sitting down to write a new book? These are their answers, some of the answers. Oh. Yep. Okay, okay, James M. Jank Jackson, which story should I write? Yeah, that's, that's nice and positive. Um, Grace Topping, need to do an outline. And she's like, ugh. Nancy Eads, plot. First thing that comes to my mind, plot. Uh, Lori Herbst, who's a mystery writer, how did the victim die? Connie Berry, Characters and settings simultaneously. She's just get that's what comes into her head. Get that straight. Uh, Susan Van Kirk, whether I can remember how to write. That's more along the lines of, of me. John Steinbeck said every time he sat down to write a short story, he didn't know how to do it. So it's it's just part of the process. Deborah Goldstein, she's a judge, a former judge. She retired to write. It's crap. <laughs> And Karina Moss, this, is, this gives you a little bit more, um, this is more upbeat, possibilities. And that's a nice way to think about it. Um, I asked the question because of what went through my head when I sat down to start writing book 20. And it was kind of like, ah! Why? Because it's so much easier not to write a novel. Novels take a lot of work and a long time. And yet I do it, and you want to do it too. So here from my own experience is how to do it. Um, first, what's a novel? A work of fiction, a made up story, lies. I used to work in the library and um, people would come in and ask for fiction and have it confused with nonfiction, which isn't a made up story. So that's, that's why I'm making sure you do know that Fiction is a made-up story. Some people say it's lies. They'll say, I tell lies for a living. Um, novelist Amy Tan, though, said that it's not lies, but one of the best ways to tell truth. And I like that. Or to find truth. Novels fall into categories, genres, which are labels. Um, main genres being things like mystery, thriller, science fiction, fantasy, romance, historical, western, literary. Um, subcategories within the genres are almost endless because of the mashups that you can do. Uh, Sci-fi western romance, for instance. It helps to know what genre you're writing, but if you don't, don't worry about it. Um, and don't let it slow you down. When mystery writer Lori Rader Day wrote her first book, she says she had no idea it was a mystery. She thought it was literary fiction, which it is very literary. But when she took it to a workshop in Indiana, one of the presenting authors told her, this is a mystery. You wrote a mystery, and it's a good mystery. And now she's written more than half a dozen of them. 
Uh, one reason to know what genre you're writing is that it helps you know what readers will expect from your book. Uh, for instance, I write cozy slash traditional mysteries. Readers know they're not private eye books. They're not thrillers. They also know there won't be anything explicit or graphic in the way of sex or gore. So it, it's, it's helpful to know that. If I wrote a cozy that had slashers in it, that just it wouldn't fly. Um, knowing your genre will also give you an idea of how many words to shoot for. These are some general guidelines. These aren't rules. There are, there are no rules in writing or writing novels. Um, except for write. So you've got sci-fi fantasy. If you look at the shelf in the library, you'll notice that many science fiction books are much bigger than other things. You look at cozy mysteries, they're often you're about that thick. Um, and there's a wide range amongst them, too. Um, I'm writing, the book I'm writing now is for a company that wants the books to be about 65,000 words. It's a mystery, but they only want it to be about 65,000. I write for another company that wants them only to be about 55,000. They've got, they're, they're marketing to people who want a quick read and nothing at all heavy, nothing at all upsetting. In a mystery, that's kind of strange, I think, but whatever. Um, the other company I write for asks for about 75,000, and that's pretty standard, 75 to 80,000 for a cozy slash traditional mystery. That's, depends on how it's printed, but it's, it's a, between, it's rough, roughly 300 pages. It might be 330, it might be less, it depends on the font. You could make it, you could make it 75,000 pages if you just put one page per word. Um, so that gives you an idea what, what you're shooting for. Uh, can I assume that you all have an idea or a, a glimmer of an idea about what you want to write about? Okay, that's if you don't, don't worry about it, but you should get one because it really does help. Um, do you need more than a glimmer when you start? Do you need a whole plot? Well, that depends on your process, and writing a novel is a process. Um, it's a process of creativity with a few mechanics and housekeeping thrown in and perseverance, because uh, writing an entire book takes a lot of hours alone typing in a room, or someplace anyway. You don't always have to be sitting down. It used to be um, one of the rules of writing is sit. Well, no, because I like to write standing up, too. So it's just better. Just you need to write. That's the thing. Um, the process, your process, isn't something set in stone either by someone else's rules or by your own rules because that's the way you've always done it. Um, it's your process and it can change and evolve just as we all do in every other part of our lives. Some people in their process are plotters and some are pantsers. Plotters plot in advance, sometimes in great detail, maybe in outline form. I tend to do an outline. Um, pantsers let the story evolve naturally they fly by the seat of their pants. That's where that comes from. Often saying that if they outline their novel first before sitting down to write it, then they'll be bored when they actually write it. Um, but I love a good outline, so I'm a plotter. But my outlines have room to grow. They're organic, making me a hybrid, half plotter, half pantser, a plantser. But now I have a new view of plotting and pantsing. Those who start with an outline or pages of notes and those who write by the seat of their pants, there's no difference between them. They're the same thing. A pantser will say they need to write a first draft to get all the ideas down. As a friend of mine says, this draft, which she calls draft zero, is usually rough as rats. She's from Scotland, I like that. The writer goes back, edits and revises and ends up with a draft one and subsequent drafts if necessary. But what is the plotter doing by writing an outline? Creating a more succinct, more efficient, rough as rats draft zero. It's just another draft. It's just a different way of, a different way of setting it up. Um, and chances are the pantser has been tossing around ideas and organizing them in their head. It's a bit of mental plotting. So beyond process, what does a novel need? A good first line, a line that makes the reader want to read your second line. 
Here's the, here are the first two lines of Come Shell or High Water, the book that I turned into a, the publisher in June. On the tail of a hurricane, half drowned in the chaos of whirlwind, deluge, thunder and lightning, I washed up on Ocracoke Island. Okay, it wasn't that dramatic. And that, that, that got me a, a three-book contract. It got you what? A three-book contract. Good. Yeah. Let's see if I can see if I can. I've got to write two more. I don't know how. <laughs> Beyond first lines, think of your novel as a series of segments. Each segment should have five steps. I learned this from suspense writer Hank Philippi Ryan. These five steps are what does your character want, why does she want it, what does she decide to do, she does it, but she meets an obstacle. So what does your character want in this segment? Your character has to want something. It doesn't have to be a big want, but you know we all want things. I want a drink of water. Um, I, want, I want to be able to uh, finish my book, whatever. Why does she want it? Well, there has to be a reason why. It might be a tiny desire with a tiny reason. It might be something cataclysmic for a life or death reason, or a life or death reason. Um, what does your character decide to do to get what she wants? This decision helps to reveal her character. So you remember to use your setting because how a person behaves is different depending on where she is, you know, in a blizzard, um, in her own living room, in the principal's office. Then your character does what she has decided to do. This gives the story action and forward motion until the obstacle. Up pops the barrier that thwarts your character from getting what she wants. Someone or something stops her on the way to her goal. Wham! So what happens next? And that could be something simple like, you know, if I'm, I, oh, I'm thirsty, I'm going to get a drink of water. I walk down the stairs and I trip and fall flat on my face. Well, that was an obstacle, wasn't it? Or it could be, um, I want to start supper on time so it's ready when the family gets home and then the cat throws up all over the floor. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it doesn't have to be big, but it can be something huge. It can be a flat tire, it can be a car wreck, it can be a bomb, but you need the obstacle. Obstacles are twists. They're the interesting part and that's what takes you on to your next segment where you start all over again. Now what does she want? Now what is, why does she want it? Now what does she decide to do now? She does it, she meets another obstacle. So every segment should have a goal, a motivation, decision making, action, and the obstacle. Um, I used this when I wrote the book that I turned in in June and it really did help propel the story forward. It's just, it's just, a, it's a crutch, but it's useful. And Hank, Hank is a, a, a best-selling author, won multiple awards, so she, she does have an idea what she's doing. Um, she, she calls these section segments, not scenes or chapters. Um, where you break your scenes or chapters varies the pace. A segment might be a scene or a chapter, or it might just be a paragraph. Um, a chapter might have several segments. Just remember to use the steps to keep the pacing and the rhythm, rhythm moving forward, because you always want to be moving forward in a novel so that you don't lose your readers. Your character should change and grow as she makes decisions and moves forward toward the end. Um, there, should just, there should be some sort of, well, change your growth. Uh, it doesn't have to be, the book that I'm writing now, book 20 for this company, they ask you to fill out a worksheet that they have to okay before you write the book. And one of the things um, in the worksheet is what, 
at the end of the book has your has helped your character come to terms with some sort of problem. It doesn't have to be a big problem. Um, so the problem that I had the main character dealing with is she's rediscovered the English teacher she had when she was in high school 20 years ago, whom she liked but also had this antagonist she, she was afraid of, you know, was afraid the teacher was too tough on her. And now that she has come through this whole situation with the mystery, she realizes that that teacher had a lot to tell her beyond, uh, you know, periods and commas in the wrong place or whatever. And she wishes now, because the teacher, of course, died two years ago, she wishes now that she had taken the time, had had the time, and then she realizes, no, taken the time to um, know her better. Because, so, you know, that, that's small, that's a small thing, but it adds a layer to the story beyond the mystery, which involved the teacher, but it's a little bit odd. Um, so your, your character should come to some sort of realization. This, this works in, in any, it can work in a children's middle grade reader. It can work in a picture book. Um, sometimes it's the, it's the reader who com comes to a realization in addition to the, to the main character. And it doesn't have to be just the main character who, who grows and comes to a, especially if you're writing a series, you've got series characters, you're going to want the, each one of your main characters or sub-characters to have some sort of growth so that it remains interesting, so it remains real. Because we are, although we are telling lies, we are revealing truth through the fiction. It seems like I missed a page, sorry. Maybe I just raced through it. Nope. Just raced through it. Okay. Um, so your character is showing change and growth as she moves towards the end, and then, if you're lucky, you reach the end. You know, those those are lovely words. But what do you do after you type them? Because you're really not done yet. You revise. Because revision is the key to success. Um, I learned that from my high school English teacher back in the 60s, and I believe it wholeheartedly. Um, there are people who will say, I can't believe it. I sat down and wrote, and it all just went right onto the paper, and it's perfect. I mean, probably not. Um, it, it depends on what you're doing with it, um, but probably not. I have a friend who's a, a poet. I have, I have two friends. I, I belong to a small critique group. Um, the other two members are poets, but also write fiction, um, children's picture books, chapter books. But it's their poetry that just really amazes me because they'll bring, one of them is doing haiku. She will bring a haiku to the critique group. It was, what, 15 words long, maybe? Haikus don't always have to be that 575. That's apparently a myth, but um, she'll bring a haiku to the critique group and we'll look at it and you can actually critique a haiku and say what's not working and she'll come back time after time having changed a word or, you know, uh, the, the line breaks and it's amazing and then she gets them published in journals and the other one writes longer poems and it's like a different language, but a, a poem can take so much work. You can do so much editing on it. You can, you can, you can. You don't necessarily have to have it rhyme, but you might have words that have a similar sound, like uh, a short I sound rather than sticking in a, a long I sound. It's, it's just an amazing editing process, an amazing revision process to watch these poets working and making things smaller and tighter and more specific. And that's what you need to do with your novel, too. You don't necessarily have to cut out huge swaths of it, but you might have to. You might also have to add things to it. 
um, what, what are you looking for when you revise? Anything that'll pull a reader out of the story and wonder what's going on. That might be too many characters. It might be too much dialogue and not enough action. I have a tendency to put in too much dialogue. Um, and I always think there's action and then it turns out there isn't. <laughs> so you, you become blind to your own stuff. Um, you're looking for continuity errors. Is your character wearing a Stetson at the beginning of a scene or a segment and at the end is wearing a pith helmet? Not because he changed it on purpose, but just because you forgot. Keep track of the names of your characters. I've, I've known people, someone was talking about this just the other day. She forgot the name of her main character partway through the book and gave him a different name. It's like, and if, if you, yeah, it's like, you find it in a rewrite. And it's just, you know, it's a brain glitch. So, yeah, I don't know which name she chose for him, but whatever. Um, <laughs> you look for inconsistencies, like names. In, or things that are too consistent, like having two people with the same name. You can do that, but you'd have to be able to make it believable. In my... Uh, Highland Bookshop Mysteries, I do have two policemen named Norman, but one of them is never called Norman because when they found it, they always have called him Inspector Reddick because that's his, you know, he's, he's an inspector. And when they finally said, you know, we don't know his name, someone said it's Norman. Oh, well, that will never do because we have our Norman. So that, that, and I did it on purpose, although I'm not sure why. It just seemed like it made sense. But I did accidentally name two people in two different books, but the same series, Freda because I like the name Freda, and I knew someone named Freda. But that's an unusual name, and how are you going to have two different people in this tiny town named Freda, for heaven's sakes? No one ever noticed, which maybe is bad. <laughs> that's not so good. <laughs> or, or they maybe were too polite. That's, we'll think that. Um, some of the inconsistencies that are tough to look for are day of the week. Um, it helps to have a calendar about what's happening on each day or in each week. It's amazing how easy it is to confuse, to, to, to jump ahead a day or put everything into one day. And as it turns out, no, they can't possibly have done all that in one day. Um, so keep track of that. Uh, I've tried doing that with an Excel spreadsheet, but I find it, uh, it's, it's, it's more helpful in Word to, uh, with each chapter heading put a note, a comment, saying what day it is. You don't need to, in the story, say, and now it's Tuesday. But um, although the company I'm writing this 6,500, 65,000 words, I do like things kind of cut and dried like that. So, OK. Um, same thing with time of day. Um, meals. Uh, you might end up having your character eat lunch twice in one day. I've done that. But you find it in rewrites, or eating breakfast after lunch. I haven't done that. I could, though. Having your characters doing too many things, going too many places. And speaking of going places, if you're writing about real places, be familiar with those places. Uh, try not to have your characters taking a half hour to drive from Champaign to Chicago, or driving south from Champaign to Chicago. Or if you have them start out driving east, don't have them then looking into the setting sun. Mm -hmm. I've, I've, seen, I've seen that. It's, and that one didn't get caught. It wasn't, it wasn't mine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you have to be aware of issues like that if you build your own world, too, not just if you're using real places. Um, it helps to keep, some people call it a Bible. Some people just call it a notebook. Um, Facts, data about your, your characters, descriptions, and of your town or whatever area you're writing about so that you can refer back to it if you write another story, but also so that um, you can refer back to it while you're writing your first story, too, you know, that, the, the one you're working on. Um, descriptions, so that you don't describe brown hair once, red hair another time on the same person. Uh, some people will draw a map of their town 
if it's a fictitious town. I did that with one of my series. Um, it really helped. And then I was able to see where I had opportunities for new businesses that I hadn't realized were there. Because if you're doing a series, you've got to keep bringing in new stuff and new characters, cause, especially in mysteries, because you keep killing them. That's not good. Did you put the map in your book, or is it just for yourself? No, it was just for myself. Some people do end up having them in a book, and that's fun. But this was just one done on, done on Excel. It wasn't pretty at all. Um, I would like to do a pretty one. Uh, listen to your story as you read it. Re either read it out loud, have someone else read it out loud, have your uh, voice recognition thing read it out loud, or just read it out loud in your head. And you're listening for things like overused words, you know, little, um, um, you know, that, that kind of stuff. You think words that you don't, that just stand out if you hear them too often. Um, so overused words, run on sentences. Having someone else read your stuff out loud helps because they're not familiar with it. They'll, they'll find the words that are missing. They'll find the words that are duplicated. They'll find the run-on sentences, or you'll hear them. They won't necessarily recognize it in case they start, unless they start panting or something because they can't breathe. Be aware, though, that if someone else reads your story out loud, they might not read it the way you expected to hear it. It's not because the words aren't good, but it's just their reading voice. And that can be deadly because not everyone can read out loud and make it sound interesting. So do be aware of that. Look for unnecessary adverbs and adjectives and weak verbs and passive voice. Um, instead of, my sandwich was eaten by the cat, you might write, the cat ate my sandwich. It's more active. You're also looking for pets. If you have pets in your book, you have to remember to feed them and take them for walks if they need it. That happens sometimes. People will forget to take care of the animals, and readers will notice that. You know, you, you left the dog alone for a week and you went off on vacation. That's you can revise as you write, revising one day what you wrote the day before. I do that. Uh, but it still helps to read the entire novel when you are done, because then you get the, the whole picture. And that's when you're going to pick up the discrepancies and the inconsistencies, because from day to day, you're just moving forward, and you might not catch that, even if you do go back and rewrite as you go. Um, that's, a, that's a process pacing thing. Friends of mine who write by the seat of their pants want to just go as fast as they can so they don't want to go back and revise as they write. I'm a slow writer and I, I do revise each day what I wrote the day before. Everyone's process works if you reach the goal you want. When you write your novel, don't look forward and paralyze yourself with worry about how long it will take you to write so many pages so many words. Think about the words you're going to write today and write those words and then you're on your way. Um, I usually keep track of my goal by, well, I, I, I'll have a deadline. For instance, the book I'm working on now is due January 1st. I want to have it done by December 1st, so I have a little bit of breathing time before I have to start the one that's due June 15th, which is a longer book. Um, so I keep, I, I take the amount of time I've got, like the, I've got about 5,000 words of the 65,000 word book. If I really jump into it wholeheartedly on the 1st of September and can get it done by the 1st of December, I think I've got, well, it, it turns out that if I write 750 words a day and 200 for six days a week and 200 words on the seventh day as a little break, I'll have it done. Um, that doesn't sound like a lot of words to many people, 
I have a friend who writes, when she was working full time as an academic librarian, she would get home from work and write 2,000 words before going to bed. I'd say, Amanda, but are they good words? Do you have to go back and revise them? Nope, she'd say. And she didn't. She's, she's got, I don't know how many books she's got out at this point, 35 or 40. She just, she's amazing, but she's a genius. I, I, I cannot write like that. There are good days when I can write as many as 1,000 or 1,500 words, but that's usually further along into the book when it's racing along. To begin with, it's still a lot of mental outlining, even though I've got an outline, because it's, it's getting to know the characters, it's getting to really know the, the setting, because you want your setting to come alive. Some people call setting another character. Um, you want people to believe that they are in that book that you're writing, no matter where it is, if it's in outer space or on an island. Um, so how do you keep going so that you do reach the end? It helps to have accountability. You set goals for yourself, a deadline. I've got a deadline set for me, but I've, I've changed it so that, but I also have wiggle room now. If I don't get this thing done by the 1st of December, I've got a month. Of course, December's not a great month because there's holidays, but I've got a month of wiggle room in case, because life happens. Um, it just does. You might, you might end up in the spring when I was working on a book, the, the book that was due in June, suddenly our granddaughter was born six weeks early and I had to rush down and take care of the little boys while she and her mom were in the hospital. And yeah, I could write while I was down there, but it doesn't work out quite as well because there's all that, there's a lot of anxiety. But I had some wiggle room, so that worked out. And smaller things happen too, you know, a, a flat tire. Things can just throw you out of your book. So you give yourself time to get back into it if you need to. Um, so a deadline is good. A number of pages or words per day, that's kind of a mini deadline. Some people do write by pages a day. I don't because I could make one big word on a page. You know, I could, and that's, that's, that's cheating, so you know, I do it by number of words per day. Keep track of your progress, that will help. Um, I use an Excel spreadsheet, I like Excel. I, I, I like filling that, those numbers in, I made it so it, it adds up all by itself, so I have the total up here and I know how much I wanna get done each month. Um, I color code it so you know, the blue days, that's a 200 word day. It, anything to keep you going. I'm very simple-minded. <laughs> Some people use M&Ms. They let themselves have M&Ms <laughs> at certain points throughout the day. I don't do that, but I, I do take a break every 25 minutes and get up and move because, you know, they say sitting is the new whatever it is. Um, smoking, there you go. Um, and I didn't smoke, but I, I Sitting, I just, I'm, I'm of an age where I, I don't want to freeze up. So I get up every 25 minutes and we have a small house that's probably not bigger from end to end as this room. So I, and I walk back and forth real fast and then I sit down and I write some more. And it, it helps. Um, some people go out and take a walk. That helps free things up and they might come back with a solution to a problem they had. Uh, Critique groups provide accountability. With the caveat that anyone can tell you how to rewrite your story. It doesn't make it right. A rule of thumb, there are no rules, but rule of thumb is if three people, if you have a, if you have a critique group of 10 people, which is actually large, and three people tell you that you should change a word or a situation, take it with a grain of salt. Always take the input with a grain of salt. If all 10 of those people, or eight or nine of them even, tell you, yeah, that needs to be changed, then you might believe it needs to be changed. Um, I belonged to a critique group back in Tennessee years ago, and we, would, we were writing short stories. We would send our stories around ahead of meeting so that we would have read them. And 
I had sent them a story that I wrote and had also submitted to Alfred Hitchcock Mystery Magazine. I also I sent it to Alfred Hitchcock. I submitted it to Alfred Hitchcock Mystery Magazine. Oh, okay. Yeah, and before we met, Hitchcock bought the story, but I didn't tell the group that because I wanted to see what they said about the story, and it was such a great lesson in anyone can tell you how to change your story because they all had ways I should change that story, and then afterwards I said, well, you know, thanks for the input. I I, I do appreciate, it, but um, I actually sold the story, and they go, oh God. Oh, um, but that's, it's, that happens. This critique group I belong to now with the two poets who, are also, who also write fiction and nonfiction. Um, one of them is a tremendous editor, and the other um, is good at seeing when something is boring. Well, I'm bored, she'll say, oh, thanks, okay. <laughs> but I, I've learned to listen to her. Uh, I've learned, I listen to both of them. They are both valuable, invaluable. They, um, but the one who gets bored easily also doesn't read a lot of fiction. So I, I do take that with a grain of salt because she doesn't read fiction. She reads poetry. And that, there's a big difference between a novel and a poem. But it's still, it's still valuable because she's, she's got good insights. Um, critique groups don't have to be in person. There are uh, online options. Uh, if you're interested in mysteries at all, Sisters in Crime is a great organization to join, whether you're man or woman. Um, and they have an online group called Guppies, the Great Unpublished. And they have lots of critique groups through guppies. And many of the guppies go on to become published, but they stay guppies because they, they, it's such a good uh, a group that's very supportive. So, there's a writer named Meredith Ireland. She writes middle grade readers, for kids, uh, third, fourth, fifth grade stuff. She says, as a writer, it's easy to feel like people are passing you by getting agents, book deals, etc. But no two writers ever have the same path. We're not horses in a race. We're possums stuck in trash bins, and you get out on your own time. <laughs> and that's, that's very true. There are so many different paths to getting published, to, to writing a novel, to coming up with an idea for a novel. Um, don't berate yourself. Just set your goal, even if it's a goal for a day, Look for the goal, the motivation, the decision making, the action and the obstacle in the segment that you're working on and take your story forward. Um, in the end, my best advice for how to write a novel is, because you, know, you, you, know, you can't really learn how to write a novel in 45 minutes, um, it's read, write, revise, repeat. That's kind of short. I might have gone too fast. Um, but thank you all for coming. Do you have any questions? Yes. Um, do you find it's really important to show and not tell everybody? Yes. Or yes. Or is there a balance there? Or is it okay well, to tell a little bit? It before? is. It certainly is. Um, and there are ways of telling without, without an information dump. Have you heard that? Right, yeah. Um, you can sprinkle the telling in little bits throughout the narrative. Because when you're writing about a setting, yeah, you can you can you can illustrate it by having your characters talking about where they are, but that can become an information dump too. You can have them notice um, the smells. Try to engage the five senses and that uh, and tell through those. Um, do you all know the difference between showing and telling? Yeah, it's, but there is, there, there are times when you do tell, and certainly in old novels, there's a lot of telling, and I don't find anything wrong with that, but these days it's, the, the readers tend to have, I guess, more fractured 
time, uh, attention. Yeah. Well, one thing is you can, you can dump it all at once and hold on to that in a file and then um, call back to it. Files of information, I, I end up with, um, for a novel, maybe a number of different folders. I'll have a folder for each draft, each, and, and that's not a complete draft. It's the draft I worked on that day. But then the next day I save it as a new draft so in case something happens because I've had strange things happen where, you know, things disappear or, or my husband says, what if they disappear? So then I go, ah, so I, <laughs> so I do that. Um, I've got a folder of just, it's called noodling, you know, where I just uh, throw in all kinds of things that I might want to put into the book. Uh, there's a, a folder of outlines because I might change the outline as I go. Of course, I change the out. It's an organic outline. I change it as I go, and I do. I go. I'll go back and change it. And that's. I don't even need to do that because I've already. But it's just part of my process. So don't don't worry if your process is a little strange. Um, it, it helps to you can you can have it all printed out if you want. But it's helpful to have it on the computer because then you can take it out and just plug it in. You can just you could write your first draft with the information dumps and the telling, and in the revision you can go back and read where it sounds like too much exposition, and then take it out and move it around, or just take some of it out. Sometimes it's okay to still keep some of that stuff in your head and not get it on the paper. If you're writing a mystery, you do have to get all the clues and things on the paper. You can't leave that stuff out, but does that help? Okay. Some people use a whiteboard, too, to keep track of what they want to, make sure they get in a road map of where they want to go, not, a, not an outline necessarily, but you know, the, what information they want to show up so that that can inform what's going to happen or what did happen. Okay. Yeah? I'm, I'm writing a cozy mystery. Oh, cool. And I'm, do you have any advice for, I, I have several suspects, and I, I know some of them are going to be red herrings, but do you have any advice for how... How do I give the readers enough information so that it's not a shock, but not too much information, and uh, so that but as you as you go I along, guess I reveal or uh, who did it, who done it. That's one where you might have to, when you get to the end, go back and make sure that you finesse it so that you've got an, you've got that. In a mystery, you can't have the villain revealed at the end and never have appeared in the story. That, that's a rule, although I'd be, I'd be interested to try to do it. <laughs> um, so, so with, with suspects, so I've started keeping track of list of suspects and where they show up to make sure that they, they show up evenly throughout. Yeah. Um, yeah, that, that helped a whole lot with the most recent one. Yeah. Um, all over, because um, we all have all ideas all the time, but from the newspaper, you know, headlines in the newspaper or overheard conversations, eavesdropping is wonderful, um, especially if you only hear part of it, you know, because then you can make up. One way to, if you have a snippet of an idea, one way to expand that is to ask yourself, what if? Answer that question and go, what then? Um, Donald Moss, who is a, an agent and editor, says, um, this, is, this is for thrillers, but it can, it can work in other situations, too. Um, you have your situation. Now, make it a little bit worse. Now, make it a little bit worse. And then, make it just a little bit worse. And so you're just you're you're moving forward and making the stakes higher and higher and higher as you as you're making things worse and worse and then you you have your twist and your ending which you know, it's like that sounds easy doesn't it? Oh, now you have your twist and ending. <laughs> God, it isn't easy. Um, the book I just 
turned in in June. The story, the idea for that came from brushing my teeth and looking in our sink, our bathroom sink. It had a faux marble. And I was looking down at, oh my God, you know, it's like looking at clouds, seeing pictures in clouds. It was a pirate. There was a pirate looking out at me with his hat and his plume and a mustache. And I'm like, I've got a haunted sink. So um, I thought that was interesting, but kind of dumb. But um, I ended up, I sold this three book series about a haunted shell shop on Ocracoke Island where there's this ghost of an accidental pirate from 1750 who is somehow attached to this gorgeous ornate shell. Um, and it's in the shell shop and it's a, mis there's, there, it's a series of mysteries and we'll see if people like it, but it, um, all because of a sink. <laughs> so ideas can come from anywhere. Do any of you have favorite places to get ideas for your stories or writing? Yes, yeah. yeah. So because back in my country, I can watch people, and uh, sometimes I get some new ideas, some different ideas. Then um, I make a scene in my mind. So I search the idea like that. Yeah, you, you give them backstory. You give you figure out where they're going. Yeah. Um, Yes. Like so I, I make notes of what I see so I can use it later. Keep, keep notes. Um, they can be a note in your pocket. They can be a note on your phone. They can be a note in a file on your computer. I've got a, a file on my computer called compost pile. And it's where I've got all kinds of ideas. Sometimes there's just a, a little snippet. Sometimes it's more of a paragraph. Um, Jim who had the, the, the first slide, you know, when I asked what, what, um, what goes in your mind, he said, what story am I going to write? Because he keeps track of the things he wants to write. And so he's not writing a, he does write a series, but he also writes a lot of standalones. And so he's, um, what, what, what story is he going to write now? Sure. Or, or, or. And then if you have an idea, write it down. Yep. And keep your index card. Yep. I've got uh, shoe boxes full of notes. And many of them I've actually translated into online, you know, in my, in my files. But I've got, I keep yeah, notebooks. I've got, look at that little notebook. That's a good one. Um, and I've got, a, I've got a bigger one. I've got two bigger ones in here. Just, I, when I worked here at the library, I walked to work so that I could stop along the way and take notes. Because if you're doing that while you're driving, you're going to crash. So um, I would just walk back and forth. Uh, I, usually, I don't have any pocket notes now, but I used to have my pockets full of notes, too. That's what nice thing about working at the library, because there's always scrap paper around. You can just pick something up and write it down. And it doesn't hurt to let people know that you're working on something. When I was in the children's department, Mike Regala, who's the head of the department, he's an EMT. He was an EMT. He's retired from that now. He's and a volunteer fireman. He gave me wonderful stories about uh, answering fire calls or, or funny things that happened. Many that I couldn't use in a cozy mystery, but it's it's a lot of fun. To, um, and you can use you can use your relatives, <laughs> you can use your friends as characters. Just be careful so they don't necessarily recognize themselves. Um, right. I, I write a, I, I've had a series of short stories in Alfred Hitchcock Mystery Magazine that have two sisters. And I started writing them when neither of my sisters lived anywhere near me. And they had both gone off to college when I was quite small. The oldest one went off to college when I was three. And we didn't live in the same town, much less the same state until I was 43. Um, so I started writing these stories before 
I really knew her very well. But both my sisters, one of the sisters in the stories is a bookseller and the other one is annoying. And both my sisters would say, the annoying one is named Bitsy, which just sums her up right there. They'd say, am I Bitsy? I'd say, no, 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 you're not. Uh, turns out I'm both Margaret and Bitsy. These are both, you know, part of me. But since then I've realized, I've come to know that one of the sisters really is kind of a Bitsy. <laughs> I didn't know that, but there she is. So she doesn't recognize it, though. Well, yeah, she, she does ask about it, but oh well. You can go shopping for characters. Um, go, to, go to the grocery store, and while you're looking for your food, look at people, and you'll find um, you know, faces. You'll find gates, the way they walk. You'll find accents, find noses. It's just, it's a great way to find all kinds of people because they're, the world is full of people and the world is full of ideas. Yeah? What advice would you give to someone writing something as a thought that differs from writing something? Oh, so how long is an episode? Um, sure. <laughs> is it, but, but they're all connected? It would be the same kind of thing, I think, that you would, you would, you could use the, the five steps to, to pull it forward. Your goal is to get to drag people in, drag your reader in, and keep them there. So you, you want your your action and your obstacles, and you got to have the motivation, what they want, what these people want. Um, I would I would think it would be much the same process. I think it's much the same process for a short story too. It's just a short story it takes a lot less pencil. Short stories. don't take, they do take less time, of course, but it's like a poem because you have to have, it has to be so succinct. When I write a short story, it might end up being like 10 pages long, but I might spend a month or two on that short story. Just uh, everything has to be so tight. So that's interesting. Mm -hmm. and then you on the model. I don't, it could be that back then, back in the 20s and 30s, short stories made much more money. Um, oh, really? There were many more uh, markets for short stories and they paid well. Saturday evening post, there were people who could make a living writing short stories. Really? Yeah. But it's, and that's, it doesn't happen these days for the most part. Yeah. Um, I started writing short stories before moving into novels because I had small children at home and limited amount of time. You know, I would write after they went to bed at night. And then I've, I've had people who only write novels and say, I cannot write a short story. Mm -hmm. By now, it's been so long since I've written a short story, I wonder if I can. But that's the same, you know, it's, same with novels. Every time you sit down, I don't know if I can do that. And I, it, it's, tr it's a real, it's a real feeling. I really, I really don't know if I can do this. Here's an interesting thing. Have you heard of Oprah syndrome? There are people who are paralyzed about writing because they're afraid that if Oprah picks up their book, they'll have to be on stage with Oprah and they won't know what to wear. I don't know if she's even on TV anymore, but I, no, no. One would think, but you, you find, you, there's, it's possible to find any, any possibility to stop yourself from writing. It's, it's so much easier not to write. I mean, think of all the things. You can read, you can watch TV. Not everybody does. Um, I like to know, I don't always know. Often with a short story I do, and sometimes with a novel I do. Especially if someone is writing from the seat of their pants, if they're a true pantster, 
and they just they have this idea what they want to write, but they don't know where it's going. Do you know who Ann Cleves is? She um, she writes mysteries. She did the the series of books that the TV show um, Shetland was based on, and Vera. Anyway, she's uh, multiply published blockbuster books, wins awards all the time. She is a true pantster. Her latest book that uh, I think has just come out, she had no idea where it was going to go. But she can sit down and, you know, she doesn't do it in a day, obviously, but she can sit down and, and write a novel without knowing where it's at, a mystery without knowing where it's going. I don't know how much rewriting she has to do. And as a friend of mine said, she probably does have this in, in mental um, outline that she's got some idea, maybe not, maybe not all the way to the end though, but she's got something working around up there about what she wants to do. It's, it's an amazing, weird process. You know, how do, how do, by the time I get to like the last chapter and I'm rushing towards my deadline, I feel sometimes like I'm pulling it out of my head with sticks. You know, it's like pulling my brains out of my head just to get it all, to, to finish it. It's just, it's, it can be a painful process. <laughs> Can be a sleepless process if you've got a deadline. Try not to do that. Any other questions? When you write a series, and I've, mm -hmm. I've been, read two of your series, how, how do you make sure that you don't like put all your good stuff in the first book? And that's, do, you, it, do you save stuff for the other ones? Or? No, and that's what this, the, the common wisdom is. No, don't do that because okay. you're going to come up with more you good ideas. More ideas. You will. Okay. Yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, don't worry about that. Do worry about information dumps, but don't worry about all your good ideas going into one book. It probably happens to some people and they can't do another, but really, you know, our, our ideas are full of heads. I mean, our, our heads are full of ideas. <laughs> my my um, oldest son, when he was three, used to say, ha, 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 my legs are full of jokes. <laughs> he, had, he had no concept of anatomy. <laughs> I sometimes I feel like my legs are full of ideas. <laughs> Good. Anything else? Okay, I'm going to ask them. Okay. Do you have any advice about um, using magic? I know one of your series has magic. I have magic in mind. I, sometimes I struggle, like, is this too much magic? Or There's all kinds stuff? of, there's some people who have tons of magic. It's, it's fine. Just, <laughs> yeah, just yeah, go for it. The company I'm working this for 65 Thousand word one, no magic. You can't have any magic. Oh, oh, oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a. Uh, that's okay. You can't have ghosts either. I love to, to do that. Yeah, I, I didn't have. I in the first book I did for them, I didn't put a ghost in, but I had someone um, who'd been thrown off a bicycle and was a little bit addled, lying in the grass, and someone said, "What are you doing?" He said, "I'm watching the trains go by." When there were no trains going by, but someone else explained it and said that. He sees the ghost trains going by from World War II when they went past with the troop trains. Um, and they said, the, the publisher said, no, you cannot mention ghosts. Oh, come on, it's a ghost train. <laughs> it's just a, <laughs> please. Oh, well, I'll use it somewhere else. I thought it was like ghost ships, but nope. So this, this other series with the pirate ghost, by golly, it's got stuff in it. <laughs> Yes. How do you describe or refer to the police when you use like soft passive, like passive that doesn't have like hard rules? You can make up your own rules for it. Um, if you believe it when you're writing it, you should be able to make it, you know, believable to the reader. Just uh, make it matter of fact, and you know, this this is the way it is, and it should work. There are certainly books that. You know, sound preposterous, but or that you know, it, not everybody is going to go along with it. That's you know, like certainly the publisher I'm writing this other book for wouldn't wouldn't believe it. But I think you'll find that your readers will believe it if you believe it and make it. Yeah, that's easy to make it believable. That's how you do it. <laughs> it's like 
find your voice. We know some people talk about you got to find your voice. Find your voice. Well, what does that mean? Um, well, you can do it. <laughs> you write from your own personality. I think that's what it is. Um, it doesn't mean you put yourself into it. Not every character is me, but um, your personality comes through in the writing. That's, that's the best I can do for voice. So how far are you in yours? Well, I'm in chapter 15. Good. <laughs> and I have outlined 38 chapters. So. That's, that's good. <laughs> so that, almost halfway through. There's a, a book by um, Richard Osman called The Thursday Murder Club, and it's a mystery. It takes place at an old folks' home in Britain. And his structure, I love the structure of that book. Um, it's told from two points of view, sometimes there might be another one in there somewhere too. But some of the chapters are just one like segment long, one paragraph. Some, each, each chapter is a scene. There aren't multiple scenes. Each one is a scene, and some of the scenes are very short. And it just really, it, it's delightful. It just drags you right along. I really like that structure. Very little, um, a little bit of scene setting at the beginning of each chapter um, so you know who is talking, where they are but not a lot of dwelling on uh, furniture, unless it's important to the story, important to that, that segment. That, that's a... What was his name? Osman, Richard Osman. Yeah, and there are three or four books. I think there's three books in the series, and the fourth one's coming out maybe this fall. Someone else said recently that Lisa Scottolini, her, her new, oh, I think it's her newest book, is just a masterpiece and could be used as a course for learning how to pace a novel and fit in all the, it's, she writes suspense and thrillers. But she's, she does really good stuff really well. Um, so that would be something to read too. Yeah. One of the best short novels I read recently, and it's old, it's not that new, is Five People You'll Meet in Heaven. What I like about it is the fact that all these key characters kind of had separate existences and then all related. And is it, do they get, all become related at the end? Is it, is it like, uh, come, or is it? What, what I found was fascinating is, and I hear this from a lot of people who've read it, mm -hmm. you start thinking of your own life mm -hmm. in terms of his viewpoint about how life works, mm -hmm. that it's interrelated. All people you know are interrelated. Oh, yeah, OK. Yeah, S some synchronicity. It's a fascinating idea. Yeah. And, and the book is structured that way. They have different character sections, mm -hmm. and they all interrelate. Very cool. It's like his idea is actually there are so many different ways of structuring a novel. Uh, it can be it can be a novel made out of short stories, which is interesting. Um, That's sort of what it is. Okay, yeah. Um, there the, there are a lot of uh, novels and poetry. There's a there's a wonderful poem. A novel and poems for kids called Catching a Story Fish. It's in the children's department by Janice Harrington. I don't know of many, are there, are there many adult novels written in poetry? Not yet. Martha Grimes did one once, I think, and I don't think it went over as well as her others. I didn't, I didn't read it. What was the question? Do you know of any adult novels that are written in verse? Lawrence Farrell Getty wrote Coney Island of the Mind. Oh. And you'd, you'd consider it a novel, not just... Um, well, to, I mean, it's, it's, it's poetry. Mm-hmm. Uh, but he was representing a certain almost over 
uh, a viewpoint of life. Okay. And they are, re and I found that that great, it's a swing book, and oh, the whole collection of poetry is called Coney Island of the Mind. I'll have to look for that. It's really great in that way. You know, and, they, and it does kind of hang as a, as as a book. It, so it has a, you'd say it has a plot to it? He has a, he has a very good viewpoint about what is the meaning of life okay. kind of deal, you know? Yeah. Uh, catching a story fish, though, actually has a plot. Um, you know, there's a, a beginning, a middle, and an end, and there's some resolution, and the, the character, the main character, has some growth and change at the end. It's, it's, it's a lovely book. Interestingly enough, poetry is shelved in nonfiction in the library. It is? Mm hmm No. Yeah. Um, poetry is shelved as nonfiction? It, 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 yeah, it's in the non, it's, it's not, I don't know if it's considered nonfiction, but it's, it's in the nonfiction mm -hmm. section, yeah. Poetry is considered nonfiction. Some of it is. You're, you're right. You're right. Yeah, yeah, because it's coming. Yeah, it's sort of like memoir stuff. There is a book I read that I couldn't remember the title that mixes poetry and fiction. It's Mrs. Death, Mrs. Death by Selena Godin. Uh, it's a really good novel, and we have it here at the library. Okay. Go and check it out. But Mrs. Poetry Death, is, Mrs. Death. Poetry cool. is mixed in, yes. Okay. Yeah, if you ever need an idea for something to read, go to your librarians, because they, they, they know everything, or they know where to find what you want, if they don't know the answer themselves. It's a tremendous resource. There's another great, you know, Thomas Wolfe, yeah. a very wordy, wordy. Oh, yeah, yeah. The thing is, there is poetry, it's uh, the title of the book of poetry, which comes out of his writing, and it's his novels segmented into poetry. Oh, that's interesting. Which is really good. Anyone else have a question? I mean, talk about words. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> did you live in Scotland? I did. Ocracoke and all those places? I visited Ocracoke a lot of times, but I did live in Scotland, lived in Tennessee. And this is, writing the books is my way of getting back there because I, here I am in central Illinois where it's so flat. <laughs> yeah. No, 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 no. This is usually, there's the main character. I was, I was wondering about I would think some of the others, you know, if you have some side characters, they might have something like that too. Um, or what if in a segment it's not the main character, but the main character notices this about another character. I think you could work it around that way because there's no rules. But it's just a, a, it is a, an interesting way of keeping pace in your story. For the Scottish books, I chose, yeah, and I yeah, because I wanted to differentiate it from the the Tennessee books where it was first person. And there are four main characters: two women about my age, a little bit younger by now, <laughs> and two younger women. And I chose the one of the American women who's living in Scotland because that would make it easier. I wouldn't have to know all the Scottish dialect. I didn't want to write in dialect, but I didn't want to come. I didn't want to do make mistakes, um, and I know I did make some mistakes anyway. But uh, the main character, that Janet, can be forgiven for making some mistakes because she's an American over there. But a friend of mine, who Katrina McPherson, I, she she writes mysteries. She's from Edinburgh. She finally read one of my Scottish books. She said, "I just I." I hadn't picked it up because um, I keep being asked to 
to be a, um, a moderator for panels of Americans writing in Britain, and I just couldn't bear the idea. And so I, I hadn't wanted to read one of your books, but I, I need to uh, confess to you that, that that's, that's what was going on. But I finally read one of your books, and you got it all right. You did it just right. So that, that, was, that made me feel very good, because I, I was afraid to even show her the books. Um, I don't usually have any trouble deciding who's going to be the point of view character. I find it easier to write first person. Mm -hmm. Many people don't, and I. I well, it's Are you limited. First person? Sometimes, yes. This oh, this new time. yeah, um, this, the book I'm writing now, book twenty, is not not first person, huh. but the series with the haunted shell, with the pirate, that is first person. It's not the pirate that's first person. Um, so you vary it. Yeah. From Just series to series. From series to series, yeah. Some people will vary within a series. Yeah, that's interesting too. Yeah. Some people will vary within the book. You only have some sections as I and some, yeah, as long as they make it clear what's going on. I think Richard Osman might do that. I think the two main, one of them is I and the other is, I can't, they might both be third person. I can't tell you how helpful this lecture is. Was it? Good. Because I have been percolating on a book, well, since I was in my 20s and I'm now 79. Mm -hmm. But I work for a company Stored, but when I was working for it, it wasn't stored, <laughs> which is a great company. And, but I knew everybody in the family that ran it. And, and while I was working there, they said, You are a writer, you are one of the few employees who gets every how this company works. And you're really one of our best. You want to write a book about it. And now, and I have, and I've done research on it. Uh, at the library here, by the way, they did great research for me on various historical aspects of this company. And now I'm thinking what you have said to me, or said tonight, mm -hmm. all of a sudden this whole book is taking form. Good. And that happens sometimes, too. I want to thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. I'm Just like I don't know how to write a book, every time I, I sit down to write a book, it, I never know how to... Very good. Very good lecture. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank you. I'm happy to sign up. Ooh. Ooh. I'm actually going to give it to my sister in law because she's a knitter, but, okay. but I read it and I, I'm reading it. Because mine takes place in a. Thank you, everyone, for coming. We'll be back in this room next Wednesday, September 6th. And that will be the workshop where to begin well with local myself, author so Ector Garb, and she'll help you plan out and start <laughs> writing a short story. And all the workshops after that will be leading up to our short story contest this November. Um, so if you, want, if you want more information, just visit champagne.org slash writers. Um, and all the information about the contest and the prizes will be there. Um, and then the, the submission form for the stories actually opens next Wednesday on September 6th, the start of the first workshop. So. Yes, yes. Great. The whole calendar is up. Just visit champagne.org slash writers for all the dates and hope to see you there. Do you know my credit wants me to write? And Thank you so much. Thank you.